Before I read the scripture today, I wanted to give you a little preface to this. Uh, I mentioned in the prayer time that uh, the city of Houston, Texas, uh, this past week demanded, uh, subpoenaed the uh, manuscripts of sermons from five pastors in the city. Uh, they had been opposed to uh, a new law that had been put in place and uh, there was a move out to put it on a referendum instead of having it just as a law that was administered without any kind of feedback from the public. And uh, in retribution for that, these pastors were subpoenaed to turn over their sermon notes, emails, and anything else that had to do with anything like that. Uh, a tremendous infringement upon the, uh, the First Amendment rights that we have as Americans. Uh, there is to be a separation of church and state, but it's a two-way street, not one way. And uh, this was really a, an overstepping of the bounds this week. And it prompted me to, uh, to consider how I would feel if that was to take place in our community. It has not been the case here. I don't anticipate that it would be, but I didn't anticipate that it would be in the city of Houston either. And so as I was getting ready to work on this Sunday's sermon, I was looking for the scripture readings that I had selected in advance a couple of months back. And uh, lo and behold, the one that came up for this week was the one about render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's. And I don't think it was a coincidence that those came up at that particular time. And so I wanted to, to look at that a little bit this morning and uh, read the text for you here from Matthew and then talk about the relationship between God and country just a little bit this morning. Then the Pharisees went out and they laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. Then he asked him, Whose portrait's on this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and so they left and went away. Amen. Would you pause with me for a moment of quiet prayer as we open our hearts and minds to hearing today's meditation. Amen. Throughout history, there have been a lot of pivotal events that have taken place. We don't have time to look at all of them this morning, but I would like to look at a few from the last half century that have put us where we are in our nation right now. You know, 1963, as you look back on it, it might have seemed like an idyllic time. 63 was a bad year. And let's take a look at a couple of things that happened back then. Sunday morning, September 15th of that year, 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. It began as a quiet, peaceful Sunday morning as most every other one ever had, but this morning was different because someone with racial hatred in their heart set off a bomb along the side of the 16th Street Baptist Church, and inside, four little girls attending Sunday school were killed that day. And as a result of that, the fabric of our society began to tear a little bit more. In 1963 also, Madeline Murray O'Hare got the Supreme Court to put a ban on prayers and Bible readings within schools. When I started school in elementary school, we started the day by saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we said the Lord's Prayer, and we had a scripture read out of the, the Bible for us that day. For a lot of kids in my class, it was the only exposure they ever had to the Bible or to the idea of praying for anything. But after that event took place with the Supreme Court, it was gone from our culture as well. And our society's fabric ripped a little bit more. Friday, November 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. 
And America lost some of its innocence, its security, its direction, as the future becomes very, very uncertain at that time, wondering whatever caused this to happen, and the fabric of our culture divided some more. The late 1960s and early 70s, protests arose against the Vietnam War. A loss of respect for authority and process came about during that time, and riots over the war and racial issues took place all across the country. A throwing off of long-held values and standards gains momentum during that time, and the fabric of our culture is further ripped. Again in 1968, Martin Luther King is assassinated in April, and Robert Kennedy in June. And racial tensions increase across the country, and there are riots in all the cities across America, including Pittsburgh, where a great deal of the Hill District was destroyed and burned during that period of time. People were injured and killed, many more incarcerated, and the fabric of our culture continued to rip. 1972. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania institutes a state lottery, and the assurances are given that this is as far as gambling would ever go in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I don't believe that even as a 20-year-old, at the time, liberal-minded college student, I believed a word of that. And today, we have it all in our state, second only to Nevada, if that, along with all the problems of addiction that it fosters and our culture's further ripped. 1973, Roe v. Wade is decided by the Supreme Court, another highly divisive moral issue that further divides our country. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, the AIDS epidemic continued to divide and pull people apart rather than bringing them together for a common cause. Television and movies become more crass and disrespectful and violent and vulgar. Some shock jocks are so bad, they have to leave the broadcast airways and go to satellite radio. And our culture's fabric is further ripped. The present day, business owners are forced to compromise their own values and beliefs as they are ordered to provide services to same-sex couples when they oppose what is going on. Businesses are boycotted because owners advocate biblical values and teachings, even though they don't discriminate against anybody in their business practices. And municipalities are sued over nativity scenes and displays of Ten Commandments. And pastors in Houston, Texas, are pressured to turn in sermon manuscripts to a city government to check for biases. And the fabric of our culture continues to be ripped. You'll notice also that the fabric is soiled, as it has been so very often over the course of our history, because of all the influences that come upon us and to which we often do not respond. Each of those things that we looked at, and many more, are another tear in that fabric of the culture. Many represent injustices that needed to be addressed, both then and now, but in each case, division has resulted along with the loss of freedoms because we just haven't come together nor handled these things very well as a nation. Today's scripture, as well as another in Romans 13, admonishes us as Christians to be good citizens. Jesus was approached with a question about paying taxes. The intent there was to trip him up so that he'd get in some kind of trouble either with the Romans or with the Jewish authorities. Someone was going to be unhappy with his, with his uh, answer to this question, whatever it was. If he says, don't pay your taxes, the Romans are going to have him arrested right on the spot for treason. If he says, certainly pay your taxes without question, the religious authorities are going to have him in trouble because he's siding with their captors. Jesus' answer is a model of wisdom. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. Essentially, he's saying, pay the tax as a citizen, but honor God in your daily living as well. The tax is a civil matter, 
providing necessary services such as roads, water aqueducts, the protection from invasion by others. They might not like Rome, they might not like the tax, they might dislike it a lot, but it was a necessity, an earthly concern that needed to be met. Avoiding the tax would accomplish no good purpose, and so give Caesar what is due to him. So what are the things that are due to Caesar? What is due to our governmental leaders? Well, the first of these, I think, is respect. There is no wrong in disagreeing or even protesting government leaders, but it has to be carried out in a civilized fashion. You see the results of disrespect in every election cycle that takes place, including the one right now. Lies are told, false accusations are made, contexts are ignored, and all presented with a voiceover accompanied by the worst picture of the opposing candidate that they can possibly find. And it carries over after the elections to a continued breakdown of communication and cooperation and serves only to build walls. And nothing, nothing gets accomplished because of that, because of that lack of respect for one another. The second thing that is due to Caesar, to government leaders, is obedience. There has, there has to be obedience for the sake of order. If you break the laws, there are going to be consequences. But what about when obeying a law violates your conscience? Again, the protest is valid, but it has to be carried out with civility. We need to be obedient to the laws and the processes of amending those laws. And I'll have more on that in a moment when we look at this a little bit closer. But that idea of obedience leads also to that third item that I would say is something that is due to Caesar, and that is process. Christians need to set aside the otherworldly mindset that we have and vote when election day comes around. If we fail to be involved in that process, we get what we deserve. Too many Christians feel that they don't want to be soiled by all the things of politics, and so they're going to stay out of that process. That is not what we're supposed to do as Christians. We are to be good and involve citizens and take part in that process as it goes along, making sure that we put our agenda out there as well as the opposition that is there without question. And so we need to be a part of the process. Christians need to be writing to senators and representatives in government and to advertisers and media respectfully and yet determinedly. It does make a difference. I won't ask you to put your hands up this morning, but I would like to ask you, have you in the last six months sent a letter to anybody in Congress or in the State House of Representatives or the State Senate? Or have you sent one to an advertiser because you were disgusted with something you saw on television? If you haven't done that, you need to be a part of the process and to be involved and let them know that there is a better way. So those are the things that are to be rendered unto Caesar. What about the things that are to be rendered unto God? It might surprise you that a lot of these are very similar in a lot of ways. The first one, again, like with the one I just mentioned before with Caesar's, is respect. God is to be held in awe. No graven images, no other gods before him, honoring the Sabbath, honoring God's name. I am so grieved when I read the response blogs that take place on all those internet news stories that show up on any network. You look at them, they always have a place for comments. I'm just grieved when I see how people so discount the reality of God or they actually blaspheme his holy name because they don't agree with the way that God's law reads. Shows absolute contempt for God and godly ways. God is worthy of, demanding of our respect. God created us. He gave us life. He gives us a breath and the water and the food that we need to be sustained. God is worthy of our respect. We need to render that unto God. The second thing, like the things with Caesar, is obedience. Again, for the sake of order, 
The Ten Commandments are there, as well as other biblical laws, to give order to our lives and to enrich our relationship between God and our relationship with other people. They are for our good, not for our restriction. They are to enhance our life, not detract from it. The third thing that we have that we need to give unto God is relationship. One of the primary reasons for which we were created is to be in a relationship with God, to know God, to love God, to serve God. It's what gives our life the purpose that it has. And then along with those lines of financial responsibility, one of the other things that is due to God is our tithe. With Roman taxes, maybe you got some benefit and maybe you didn't. With God, the word is in Malachi chapter 3, for us to bring in the tithe and see what great blessings God will bestow upon us in return. Is it rational to think that by giving more you might be more greatly blessed, even materially, than you were before? It might not seem so, but you can't experience that miracle and blessing unless you take that step in faith yourself. A big difference here is that with Rome, you had no choice. With your taxes, you have no choice. But our giving to God is entirely our choice. What can we do when these two loyalties collide? Personal beliefs and the demands of the state. In a final analysis for the Christian, the things of God must take precedence. God is eternal, as is his kingdom. The average span of time an earthly empire has stayed in power over history is about 250 years, with Rome being by far the longest at 1500. Even Rome isn't what it used to be, so none of them lasts forever, only the kingdom of Christ. While the pressure is on to conform and abandon personal beliefs, if you take those beliefs seriously, you can't set them aside. You stand by them and sometimes find that to be an unpleasant thing, but you honor God through your obedience and you honor the earthly powers by initiating change the right way. Elections are coming up. Do your part to be informed, to know what the candidates advocate and how those compare with the word of God and then respond accordingly to that. Being respectful, being obedient, and being a part of the process. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at the world around us, we're concerned about all the division that is there, all the expectations that are placed upon us, all the pressure to abandon things that we have held as being important for many generations. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd help us to heed these words of Jesus and also those of Paul as he writes in Romans. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand how we can make a difference in the world around us, how we can be involved in that process, and how we can still maintain the integrity of our faith. We ask, Lord, that you give us that guidance, that you'd use us for that purpose we might make the world and our nation a better place in the days that lie ahead. In Jesus' name we pray.